So we want to honor Dr. King and it's a day we will take off. So next Monday, no, no class, and, but we will be meeting Tuesday at 9 a.m. from 9 to 10 or from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. in the evening. So that's the first thing so that you know so that you don't show up next Monday. Um, that's why you know those calendars are so very important. And then I send you reminders. How many of you have been receiving my emails? Okay, wonderful. And those of you who are not receiving the emails, it's because I have it. Either you gave me your email, but I couldn't read it. <laughs> because it's hieroglyphics. And, and people think, you print it even twice if you have to. Because if you miss just one letter, then it, it won't go there. So if there are sign-up sheets there in the back. Write down your email, but write it legibly if you want to receive email reminders. Because I send you the email reminders to let you know uh, about things like next week, for example. And other things, like I send you an email about uh, the Catholic company's morning offering. And that's one way that you can, you just give them your email and every single day you will receive an email with uh, the daily readings, a short little reflection and other very wonderful things. And it's completely free. So it's a great way to start your morning. I get that every single day in my email. Uh, so I send you those type of things there through the email. And then uh, some book recommendations. Uh, I gave you two book recommendations. The one that I think is the best uh, for to start off the new year is The Gift of Peace by Cardinal Joseph Bernardine. You can get it in the library. You don't have to order it on Amazon, although you know, it's very inexpensive. Again, it's called The Gift of Peace, and it's a very profound book. And I think you, we can all use that message of inner peace. We could all um, use that message in, in, for ourselves. You know, so I highly recommend that one. And then the other one was The Cost of Discipleship by a Lutheran pastor during World War II. His name uh, was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he gave up his life for the gospel, while many Catholic bishops, uh, Lutheran bishops, pastors, priests uh, supported Hitler, he was one of them who didn't. And that, of course, cost him his life. Uh, so, uh, so, again, it's called The Cost of Discipleship by uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and all of that is there uh, in those emails and so if you want to write down your email if I don't have it that would be very helpful uh, I'm showing off uh, one of my Christmas gifts okay <laughs> isn't it a nice sweater <laughs> Anyway, it's good to be with all of you here this morning. Thank you for coming. I don't take you for granted. I know you, you, you have very busy lives. And so it's good that, you, that you're here. It's good for us to be together. Uh, and I hope that you know I do work hard on these. It takes me hours and hours and hours and hours to put these together. So uh, I don't take the fact that you're coming and, you know, I don't just get up here and... I try to prepare my best to give you something to take away uh, because I do value your time and that you're giving up your time to be here. So thank you for making the effort that you're here. As coming to church, thank you for coming to church and for everything and for supporting the church with everything. We're, we're very, very grateful for each one of you as we pray today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for our beautiful day in Las Vegas, for the sun shining. And we pray that your, your light may always shine in our hearts and in our lives. We thank you for the gift of your word that comes to fill us with peace, that peace that our lives so desire. And we ask you for that gift as we continue to pray, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day. And forgive us our trespasses as we and lead us not. And we invoke our Blessed Mother's intercession, especially today, as she interceded for the people at the wedding feast in Cana. So we know she continues to intercede for us, to pray for us, as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace. to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so I just want to mention some things because uh, I didn't get to say much last week about the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord. Yesterday we celebrated the great feast of the baptism of the Lord, that our Lord Jesus Christ was baptized as all of us have been baptized. Every time we come into church, we dip our fingers in the holy water and we make the sign of the cross. That is confirming our own baptism, the fact that each one of us has been baptized. Now, when you're walking into church, we have that big baptism font that, of course, signifies the entrance into the church, that baptism is our entrance into the life of the church through baptism. But you only need a little bit of the holy water to remind yourself of your baptism. You don't have to take and bathe yourself in it. You know, like I see some people taking all of this holy water as if thinking that somehow... Uh, you're going to receive more blessing because uh, you get more holy water. All of, all of those, what I call holy reminders of what, or what we call in the church sacramentals are just that, to remind us. Holy water it reminds us of how much God loves us and God's presence in our lives and that we have been claimed through baptism as God's sons and daughters, as his children. You know that the Bible makes it very clear that God does not have grandchildren. God does not have nieces or nephews. God has children. You and I are God's children and God is our father. And this is so very powerful in our life. And so we have to remember, the Lord our God is with us, constantly flowing with us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Remember, as Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended upon him and anointed him. And then the heavens opened and the voice declared, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. The same thing happened at our baptism when the Holy Spirit descended upon us and the Holy Spirit is with us and God is pleased with us. God walks with us. And so we have to remember that God is with us everywhere, everywhere. Just because I have gallons of holy water or lots and lots of statues or crucifixes or images doesn't add more of the presence of God to me. God is with me no matter what. All of those things, crucifixes, holy water, they're reminders, they're good things, but they do not add to the presence of God in our life. God is with you no matter what, because God loves you no matter what. And this is so very important for us to remember. This became very clear for me in my last parish when this gentleman would run after me all the time. He would come almost on a daily basis and he wanted gallons of holy water. I mean gallons of holy water all the time. And finally, the culmination of the whole thing happened when he didn't find me and he looked all over for me and found me in a Walmart. <laughs> and he says, Father, I need holy water. And I said, oh no, this has to stop. So I said to him, listen, okay, invite me over to your house, okay? 
and I will bless your faucet. <laughs> And then you will have holy water coming out. <laughs> so we want to be careful that we're not superstitious. We want to guard ourselves against superstitiousness. God loves us no matter what. Nothing, nothing that we can do, you and I, can make God love me any more or any less. God loves me and God will always love me unconditionally. And you know why God loves you and God loves me? Just because you are you. And this is what the first reading that we will be hearing this coming weekend speaks about. It is Isaiah chapter 62 verse 1 through 5 as you listen. I will speak out to encourage Jerusalem. I will not be silent until she is saved, and her victory shines like a torch in the night. Jerusalem, the nations will see you victorious. All their kings will see your glory. You will be called by a new name, a name given by the Lord himself. You will be like a beautiful crown for the Lord. No longer will you be called forsaken or your land be called the deserted wife. Your new name will be God is pleased with her. Your land will be called happily married because the Lord is pleased with you and will be like a husband to your land. Like a young man taking a virgin as his bride, he who formed you will marry you. As a groom is delighted with his bride, so your God will delight in you. The word of the Lord. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah from whom we have just heard, is not alone among the prophets in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, in portraying our relationship to God in images of covenantal love. For example, we have the prophet Hosea who says, Yahweh will betroth you to myself forever with tenderness. The prophet Ezekiel spins a marvelous tale of courtship, betrayal, and redemptive pardon to explain the history of God's commitment to Israel. The metaphor of marriage, imaging God's relationship with the people of God, is deep in the Hebrew Bible. Yahweh is to Israel as a husband is to his wife. Israel is the people of God. We as the church are the new Israel, the new people of God. Jesus himself applies this tradition to himself in the Bible. For example, when the Pharisees ask Jesus why his disciples are not into extra fasting like those of John the Baptist, you remember that that's from Mark's chapter 2 verse 18. In Mark's gospel, the Pharisees are complaining to Jesus, how come your, your disciples, that is disciples are your students, those who are following Jesus, how come they don't fast as those of John the Baptist did. And Jesus replies and says, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? Jesus then calls himself the bridegroom. He is our God. We as the church, the church is the bride of Christ. Therefore, we are married to Jesus. You and I, because we are the church. The church is not a building, it's not priests, it's not the Pope or bishops or nuns. The church is us. We are the church. That's, that's why, you know, even if we didn't have a building, we could be gathered somewhere, two or three, as the early church. In the early church, Christians would gather in their homes, two or three. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them, says Jesus. Two or three make the church. We are the church. The Pope is part of the church. The bishops are part of the church. The priests are part of the church. 
But we are the church, and Jesus is married to us. And if you think about it, how is the husband and wife joined together? It's a very intimate relationship. Very intimate relationship. God is joined with you in such a way that is so deep and so profound. You've got him with you, and he delights in you as a husband is called to delight in his wife or a wife is called to delight in her husband so the lord delights in us and is happy with us so the church is the bride of christ and we as the church are thus married to christ for he is the bridegroom and this is where i always get very upset when people say to me oh you're single <laughs> Priests are not single. In Latin, we call priests the other Christ. Altur Christus, the other Christ. Priests are married to the church, that is the people. We are married to you. I am not a single man. I am married to all of you. Whether I like it or not. For better or worse. <laughs> and as the Lord delights in us, we are called to accept that acceptance from the Lord. Isaiah goes beyond the other prophets in the Hebrew Bible. He presents an outright celebration of marriage here. God's relation to Israel is an undying covenant of love and fidelity. As we have just heard here, you shall be called my delight, for the Lord delights in you. As a young man marries a virgin, your builder shall marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so shall your God rejoice in you. And this is forever. Think about the joy when a couple is married in, in, in the beginning of their marriage, when they're getting married on their wedding day. When the, it's, it's, it's a joy beyond any explanation that's why when you as a priest when you celebrate weddings it's such a joy-filled time they're all so focused on each other you know they're oh my gosh it's it, it, and we pray that it continues you know for the rest of their life of course we know life it's, you know from your own experience it, it's a different story later on and, <laughs> as, the, <laughs> as the time progresses. But think at the beginning when you attend weddings and when, when the bridegroom looks at his bride and the, and the bride looks at her bridegroom, that delight. Well, this continues forever and ever with us and God. God God's delight in us never ends as it ends in, in marriages, in so many marriages, doesn't it? It ends. Why? Because we are human beings. We are sinful. God is not. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's delight on us and in us and with us never ends. He is always, always delighted with you. God is pleased with you. He made you and He doesn't make junk. And this is very important for us because so many times in our life we think like there's something wrong with us. We think like, you know, somehow I'm not enough. Like, how could you have made me this way, Lord? Whether it be my body, whether it be me internally, the fact that I may not be as patient as I may want to be, the fact that I may get angry from time to time. How could you have made me this way? Look at, you know, I, I, I have this issue that issue i have these quirks those quirks how is that god is happy with you the way you are god accepts you the way you are you are called to then accept yourself which is a lot harder that is a lot harder but in essence every single day if god is happy with me and god delights in me and god loves me the way i am not the way i may want to be but God loves me the way I find myself 
right now, right here, at this current time in my life, then I should get up every morning, and this is what I do, and I invite all of you to do the same. Before I brush my teeth in the morning, okay? This is, I invite all of you to do that, okay? Before I brush my teeth in the morning, I look in the mirror and I say, Lord, with me, you've outdone yourself. <laughs> Because the Lord has outdone himself with each and every one of us. Each and every one of us. Because he made us. In his great love, he fashioned us. So, there is nothing wrong with you. You have to accept yourself as you are, for God accepts you as you are. God's desire and delight is to be one with us, to share in our life and destiny through thick or thin. God is with you and he's delighted in you and he loves you. This is so very important. You know, maybe you haven't heard this in a long time. So many of us, you know, we have a problem in our life because we don't feel loved, cherished, desired. Well, I'm here to tell each and every one of you today that God loves you the way you are and is calling you to love yourself and to accept yourself. And that is the beginning of a transformation in us as people. When I begin to accept myself with all my quirks, all the faults and failures that I may have, realizing that I'm a sinner. And that I need God. If I was perfect, I wouldn't have needed Jesus, my Savior, my Messiah. We all need a Savior. And He came to save us because He loves us. Plain and simple. Stop asking yourself, why would God ever want to save somebody like, like me? As wretched as I may be. There's just one answer. God saved you because He loves you just the way you are in His great mercy. And with that, we look at our second reading for this coming weekend. And it's Corinthians chapter 12. Now, concerning what you wrote about the gifts from the Holy Spirit, I want you to know the truth about them, my friends. You know that while you were still heathen, you were led astray in many ways to worship of lifeless idols. I want you to know that no one who is led by God's Spirit can say a curse on Jesus. And no one can confess Jesus is Lord without being guided by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts but the same Spirit gives them all. There are different ways of serving, but the same Lord is served. There are different abilities to perform service, but the same God gives ability to all for their particular service. The Spirit's presence is shown in some way in each person for the good of all. The Spirit gives one person a message full of wisdom, while to another person the same Spirit gives a message full of knowledge. One and the same Spirit gives faith to one person, while to another person He gives the power to heal. The Spirit gives one person the power to work miracles, to another the gift of speaking God's message, and to yet another the ability to tell the difference between gifts that come from the Spirit and those that do not. To one person He gives the ability to speak in strange tongues, and to another He gives the ability to explain what is said. But it is one and the same Spirit who does all this as he wishes. He gives a different gift to each person. Christ is like a single body which has many parts. It is still one body even though it is made up of different parts. In the same way, all of us 
whether Jews or Gentiles, whether slaves or free, have been baptized into the one body by the same Spirit, and we have all been given the same Spirit to drink. For the body itself is not made up of only one part, but of many parts. If the foot were to say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not keep it from being a part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I am not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not keep it from being a part of the body. If the whole body were just an eye, how could it hear? And if it were only an ear, how could it smell? As it is, however, God put every different part in the body just as he wanted it to be. There would not be a body if it were all only one part. As it is, there are many parts, but one body. So then, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, nor can the head say to the feet, well, I don't need you. On the contrary, we cannot do without the parts of the body that seem to be weaker. And those parts that we think aren't worth very much are the ones which we treat with greater care, while the parts of the body which don't look very nice are treated with special modesty, which the more beautiful parts do not need. God himself has put the body together in such a way as to give greater honor to those parts that need it. And so there is no division in the body, but all its different parts have the same concern for one another. If one part of the body suffers, all the other parts suffer with it. If one part is praised, all the other parts share its happiness. All of you are Christ's body, and each one is a part of it. In the church, God has put all in place. In the first place, apostles. In the second place, prophets. And in the third place, teachers. Then those who perform miracles, followed by those who are given the power to heal, or to help others, or to direct them, or to speak in strange tongues. They are not all apostles or prophets or teachers. Not everyone has the power to work miracles or to heal diseases or to speak in strange tongues or to explain what is said. Set your hearts then on the more important gifts. The word of the Lord. As we have just heard here, this is such a powerful reading. Paul compares the church to a human body. In order to pick up a glass of orange juice, it is not enough to have an arm and four fingers. Without an opposite thumb, you are lost. There are all kinds of things inside of us we need without thinking about them all. Few people get up in the morning and think about their colons, <laughs> unless you're going for a colon colonoscopy, okay? I heard those are painful, <laughs> especially the prep I heard. Or their collarbones or their mitochondria. You don't think about that when you get up in the morning. We are very happy to have two of everything we're supposed to have, two of, and we are happy to have everything we are supposed to have one of. We have a built-in sense of wholeness that will not go away. And Paul is trying to persuade people here that what was true inside their own skin, on the inside of you, that your body needs all of its parts, in order to be whole is also true outside of it that the wholeness is a matter of different parts all being themselves and doing their jobs you don't want the colon to do the job of the heart or the heart to do the job of the colon unity and diversity are not contradictory terms 
Our survival depends not on our sameness, but on our, on our infinite variety. Well, all is fine when we talk about our liver and our kneecaps, right? We rejoice at their differences and we wouldn't want either to be like the other. But it's a different story when we talk about us living in a community with a bunch of other people who look, smell, oh yes, <laughs> think, talk, and act differently than I do. You see, Paul is saying that just like your own body on the inside is different, and you want it to be different. You don't want the parts of your body to be the same because they have to be different to work together. Your hand, you don't want your hand to do the job of your foot. So the same thing with all of us on the outside. We are all one body. We are all one body. And this is a good thing that we are all one body. Differently made. All of us are different. And our differences are not a bad thing. They're a good thing. There's nothing wrong with our differences. We got people who are perfectly cheerful, for example, all around us and who can talk for 30 minutes straight without stopping to breathe. I have met some of them. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> One time I was meeting with somebody and they were talking, and I'm telling you, it was like forever. They were talking and talking and talking, and all of a sudden, I don't know, I must have not looked too interested or something. They said, Am I boring you? And I said, no, not at all. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we are called to celebrate our differences because they're for the good. God is saying that the fact that we're different is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. We have other people in our midst who've been so beat up by life that everything the person says comes out as a sneer. You don't... There's no way you can understand a person unless you've walked in their shoes. And so rather than pretending to look at a person and pass some sort of a judgment on them, let's try to understand them. They have a past just like you do. And that's probably why they act the way they do. One person speaks so intimately of God around us and it makes us feel like, feel like we're... Spiritual, spiritual slouches. Another prays big hot air balloons on Sunday and then goes home and beats his family around when he goes home. This is all part of the community. No wonder we like it better when we talk about livers and kneecaps. <laughs> because we do not handle the infinite variety outside of us nearly as well as we handle the one inside of us. And this is the challenge Paul here presents to us that we join a community looking for closeness, support, some measure of safety, and nine times out of ten what you get is this struggle to live and work with people who are just as messed up as you are. It's like the lady I met in uh, in a grocery store and I hadn't seen her in, in church for a long time and I said to her, I said, you know, I haven't seen you in church in such a long time. How come you don't go? What happened? And she says, Father, I just can't handle it anymore. The church is so full of hypocrites. And I said, well, don't worry, there's always room for one more. <laughs> In other words, we've all got issues. When you, when you look at somebody else and you notice the splinter in their eye, you're not noticing the big beam that you have in your own, as Jesus says. In other words, you are not the last Coca-Cola waiting in the desert. Not one of us is the last Coca-Cola waiting in the desert. We are not. You have issues as well. I, I, I know this is a, 
this, this is news for some of you here today because so many of us, we think we're just so perfect. You know, we have absolutely nothing wrong with us. You know, it's like when I talk about going to confession and somebody will say, Father, but I have no sins. <laughs> and I say, well, then let's, let me take down the, the statue of Mary that's there in the church and put you up there because, I mean, you know, we... We all have issues. That's why the Bible calls us sinners. We're not perfect. You have issues as well. Yeah. And people accept you with your issues. So why can't you accept them? In other words, the people in your life accept you. Your husband accepts you. That's why he stays with you. Okay. Your wife accepts you. Your children. Those who are your friends. The people in the church. Why can't you accept them the way they are? And the other thing is God accepts you with your issues. In other words, He delights in you the way you are. As we heard in the first reading. And He loves you the way you are. So why can't you offer that same unconditional acceptance to others in your life? Why can't you learn to put up with the people in your life? They put up with you. Mm -hmm. You have to accept people where they are at, not where you want them to be. You know, it's like if you have children who are drug addicts, they're still your children, even though they may be addicted to drugs. And if they're addicted to something like methamphetamine or heroin, or it's, it's, it's almost an impossible addiction. And you have to love them with their addictions the way they are. You may not, you know what, there's no perfect parents either in this life. But they're your parents. Accept and love them the way they are. The biggest change happened in my life uh, when you know, I've already told all of you that you know that I used to be like 300 pounds, almost 300 pounds. And the beginning of my change, and people want to know, you know, how is it that you were able to lose weight? Diet and exercise, yeah, okay? But it's the inside that you've got to work on first because that's where the real healing has to happen that then gets manifested on the outside. And so one of the things that happened to me in going to counseling is I was able to come to accept the people in my life the way they are. In other words, you know, one of the things that happened was after my parents got divorced, my mom found this gentleman who after some time he came and he started living with us with me and her because my brother lived with my with my uh, father he went to live with my father and he, as you know this from your own lives step parent parents and all those type of family is so normal today but there's a lot of issues that happen and obviously i resented my stepfather Right? My mother married him, but I resented him because I wanted my family back. I didn't want him in my life. When I was a teenager, I didn't want, I, I wanted my father. And so a lot of things happened, including uh, exchange of words. And I began to have these strong negative feelings toward him and we would fight. We'd have terrible fights. Absolutely terrible fights. And it came to the point where he told my mother. He said, uh, either he goes or I go. And my mom came to me and she said, you have to go and move in with your father. Well, can you imagine the betrayal I felt? And then I began to have these very negative feelings and towards my mother as well. And all of that then translated itself into me blowing up. Because the stress, the anxiety. Well, later on, I went back to live with my mom after uh, um, she ended up leaving that guy. Uh, but to make a long story short for all of you, 
the healing process in my life began when I realized, had this aha moment of grace, that my mother loved me the way she knew how to love me. And that my mother loves me the way she knew how to love me. She's a product of her past, an alcoholic father that beat them. I mean, I could go in through all sorts of details, but my mother is a product of her past, and so is my father. And they loved me the way they knew how to love me. And I'm in turn called to accept them and love them the way they are. And they're my parents. They love me with their own quirks. They're not perfect, but neither am I. I've caused pain in their life as well. Through my own inability to accept them. All sorts of things. So... The point is the people you have in your life, they love and cherish you the way they know how to love and cherish you. And you have to accept that and love them and cherish them the way they are, not the way you may want them to be. And pray for them. You see, so many of us, we talk to the people in our life, for example, if they don't go to church, we talk to them all the time about God. Go to church, go to church. You know, God this, God that. Talk less to them about God and more to God about them. Show them by your example who you are and what you believe. Not with your mouth. <laughs> and so many problems in our life could be avoided if we just learn to shut up in your marriages, with your children. How many, how many of us have children, I should say how many of you have children, who are off the path in one way or another? And I'm not just talking about the path of going to church and, and believing, but off the path. And you could be pounding at them and pounding at them. None of that works. Show them compassion, understanding, listen to them, accept them as they are. If, you're, if your daughter gets pregnant and she's 15 and she's so afraid to come and tell you, she's going to make a greater mistake. She's going to go and have an abortion and be scarred for the rest of her life. But if she knows that she loves you and she's got a friend in you and that she can tell you anything, and that you will accept her and love her with the mistakes she has made, then you and her can get through that. So, when we talk about community, we're not just talking about the church. We talk, community is our own community that is represented by our family, by our workplace. You're called to accept the people at your work the way they are in society, in our country. And you know, most of us have this romantic notion of living in community. And that is why we are so miserable in community. Many of, and how many of you are so miserable in your own community that you have inside your house with the people that you're sharing your life with? Because you have some sort of a romantic notion that they're supposed to be some, some some way that you have conjured up in your head and know that they are the way they are. Put up with it and deal with it. When you stop hoping for a different community than the one you have and learn to live and cherish the one you have, you can begin the process of healing and wholeness. When I stopped hoping for different parents, the process of wholeness began in my life. And the pounds melted away. Mm -hmm. It's a great testimony. Believe me, I'm talking here from my own experience. What better way to open ourselves up to the God beyond our knowing? Do you know much about God? Please. We know so little. It's the great unknown. What better way to open ourselves up to the God that we cannot fully ever know 
than to open ourselves up to the neighbor beyond our knowing. You really don't know the people in your life. You're not living inside of them. You don't know what they're going through. You don't know them. Open yourself up to them. Accept them as they are. Paul says that when one of us suffers, the others suffer. And when one is honored, the others feel honored as well. But it doesn't work that way very often in our life. Oh, we may feel sorry for each other or glad for each other. But if someone hits you, I don't get a bruise, do I? Or if someone around you in your workplace, if they get a raise, my standard of living doesn't go up. That's why there's so much jealousy and envy all around us. Jealousy and envy. We have to rid ourselves of that. Paul is not speaking metaphorically, but metaphysically. He is stating a solid reality. He did not say, you are like the body of Christ. He says what? You are the body of Christ and individually members of it. You are the body of Christ. When I was a deacon in Michigan for one year, I was ordained a deacon on April 22nd, 2009. And I, for one year, I was a deacon until I, actually 13 months before I was ordained a priest. In Detroit, Michigan, there was, there's always every year a huge Martin Luther King Day march. And this came to the forefront as I was preparing this particular uh, Bible study for all of you. Because next week, next Monday, that's the reason why we won't meet on Monday, but on Tuesday is the celebration of Dr. King's uh, day and every year in Detroit they have this March for Peace that is organized by the local clergy there and I was appointed by the pastor of the parish where I was serving to represent the Catholic Church since I was a clergy member who was a deacon and I didn't know that the clergy would lead the march with the people of the congregations the different congregations that participated in this march and the clergy were at the at the front with the big banner honoring dr king and everybody else was behind us the members of the congregations and we all marched and we were going to sing he's got the whole world in his hands that's what we were singing he's got the whole world in his hands you know that particular song it's a wonderful one and just before we left to march we got word that the ku klux klan was waiting for us at the square that we were marching towards and this news rendered me somewhat breathless there was plenty of police around so it was not physical violence that i feared i feared my own reaction to people i had heard so much about all of my life here in the united states people famous for their hatred who called themselves christians just like me it's like those people who protest uh, Funerals, military funerals, the, the Westboro Baptist Church. And they call themselves Christians as well. Well, you know that the members of the Ku Klux Klan uh, call themselves Christians as well. They claim to be Christians. In their, in their motto, they are not just against those who are not uh, their color, but they're also against Catholics as well. Protestant Anglo-Saxon -Saxon is one criteria in order to be a member there. Well, I feared my own reaction to these people that I had heard so much about. I feared for my soul, not only for what they might do to it, but more so what I might do to it myself by returning their hate. It's the same thing I always fear when, whenever I went to uh, the March for Life, which is also coming up. We used to go from the seminary to the March for Life in Washington, uh, marching against uh, Roe versus Wade, which legalized abortion in this country en masse. Uh, I also went to the one in San Francisco, and there's also there's 
great protests from the other side as well. So I always fear that when this, this particular thing happened here on this day with this march on Martin Luther King's day. And they held up their signs so we could not miss them, the Ku Klux Klan. And one featured a picture of Dr. King's head with a rifle viewfinder zeroed in on it and a sign that read, our dream come true. Another sign read, James Earl Ray made our day. And yet another sign read, Christ is our King. <laughs> and, we began, and we were looking at those signs with those people there, the members of the Ku Klux Klan, all of us, and we're continuing to sing, He's got you and me, brother, in His hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. I was not scared anymore. I was mystified because if the song is right, and if Paul is right, then I had just walked past some members of my own body. If Paul is right, if the Bible, if, and if the Bible doesn't lie, then when I'm walking past the members of the Ku Klux Klan who obviously hate me because I'm Catholic and an immigrant to this country, then I just walk past some members of my own body who were as hard for me to accept as cancer or a blocked artery. Cancer is hard for us to accept or a blocked artery as is the acceptance of people who may hate us. And yet, if I did not accept them, if I let them remain separate from me the way they wanted me to, then I became one of them. One more of the people who insist that there are some people who cannot belong to the body. This is the same with the terrorists in our midst today. If you allow their hate to infiltrate you and eat away at you and cause you to return their hate with hate, then you are allowing them to win the battle for your soul. Mahatma Gandhi said very poignantly, an eye for an eye will make the whole world blind. Jesus gave us a new way of living Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Turn the other cheek. That's the way of Jesus. That is the way of Mahatma Gandhi. And that is the way of Dr. Martin Luther King. I want to share with you the recent, you all know the recent story that was in the news all over, the attacks in Paris when the terrorists blew themselves up or walked in with guns and 130 people were massacred. And Antoine Laris from Paris, who lost his wife Helene in the Bataclan Theater in Paris, his Facebook tribute to his wife and a challenge to his killers has since been shared thousands of times. And I want to share this with you here this morning. And it is entitled, I will not give you the gift of hating you. I will not give you the gift of hating you. And listen to this. This is Antoine's letter to the killers. Antoine who was left with a 17-month-old baby as his wife was murdered. Friday night, you took an exceptional life, the love of my life, the mother of my son, but you will not have my hatred. I don't know who you are, and I don't want to know. You are dead souls. If this God for whom you kill blindly made us in his image 
Every bullet in the body of my wife would have been one more wound, wound in your heart. In his heart. Every bullet in the body of my wife would have been one more wound in his heart. So no, I will not grant you the gift of my hatred. You're asking for it, but responding to hatred with anger is falling victim to the same ignorance that has made you what you are. You want me to be scared, to view my countrymen with mistrust, to sacrifice my liberty for my security. You lost. I saw her this morning, finally after nights and days of waiting. She was just as beautiful as when she left on Friday night. Just as beautiful as when I fell hopelessly in love with her over 12 years ago. Of course I am devastated by this pain. I give you this little victory, but the pain will be short-lived. I know that she will be with us every day and that we will find ourselves again in this paradise of free love to which you have no access. We are just two, my son and me, but we are stronger than all the armies in the world. I don't have any more time to devote to you. I have to join Melville who is waking up from his nap. He's barely 17 months old. He will eat his meals as usual, and then we are going to play as usual. And for his whole life, this little boy will threaten you by being happy and free. Because no, you will not have his hatred either. I think this speaks for itself. As we strive our best to be the followers of Jesus in a very broken world. We listen to this man, this great example of how all of us should react to adversity and hatred in our own lives. And with that, let's look at the gospel for this coming Sunday. The wedding feast at Cana, which is very, very famous, and it's chapter 2 of John's Gospel. Two days later, there was a wedding in the town of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine had given out, Jesus' mother said to him, They are out of wine. Jesus replied to his mother, What does this have to do with me, woman? My time has not yet come. Jesus' mother then told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now the Jews have rules about ritual washing, and for this purpose, six stone water jars were there, each one large enough to hold between 20 and 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill these jars with water. They filled them to the brim. And then he told them, Now draw some water out and take it to the man in charge of the feast. They took him the water, which now had turned into wine, and he tasted it. He did not know where this wine had come from, but of course the servants who had drawn out the water knew. So he called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone else serves the best wine first, and after the guests have drunk a lot, he serves the ordinary wine. But you have kept the best wine until now. 
Jesus performed this first miracle in Cana, in Galilee. There he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Now, I want to focus on something here. Jesus and his mother. And particularly here in Las Vegas, in recent uh, weeks, we had these fundamentalists who were invading our churches. And one of the videos that is circling online has one of them saying, we want to come back and smash one of the statues of Mary here. Of course, they hate us also. And they claim to be Christians. They say they are Christians, just like the people of the Ku Klux Klan, the people who blow themselves up, say they are believers in the same God we believe in, right? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They say they are believers. They believe in God. The people who protest at military funerals say they believe in God as well. And this has been at the forefront here because I wanted to talk about this and to talk about the intercessions of saints with all of you because this is a classic example of one of the saints, the queen of all saints, Mary, not just the mother of Jesus, but each one of our mothers as well. She is our mother interceding here. And Jesus' response to Mary here might find, you might find very interesting. He calls her woman. And this is a very unusual way of addressing your mother in Jesus' world, in his culture. There's no parallel to this in either Hebrew or Greek literature. After birth, boys and girls will routinely brought up together exclusively by women, mothers, aunts, or sisters. Since boys were highly valued in this culture, they were pampered and spoiled by the women in their lives. A strong relationship resembling codependency developed between mothers and sons, especially the eldest son. When boys entered the male world at the age of puberty, they experienced a rude awakening. This harsh hierarchical world was a contrast to the woman's world from which the young men just emerged. So as he grew into adulthood, a young man tried to weaken those strong emotional ties with females. In a very public society like the Mediterranean world, the young man would seek to demonstrate his independence by rejecting the claims of all women upon him, including his mother. And in that sense, Jesus, you have to remember, is fully human and fully divine, both God and human being. So his humanity here is shown through. He wants to be independent. He's having a good time at the party, is he not? And you know, Jesus liked parties. He started his life out. His, this particular miracle is the start of Jesus' public life here on earth. This began his ministry. He began his life with a party. And there was wine there, wasn't there? And how did Jesus end his time here on earth? with another party, which we celebrate each and every time we go to Mass. It's a party. It's a banquet. They all sat around and had a good time. And yes, there was wine there too, wasn't there? Jesus, you could say, was a party animal. He loved parties. He liked having a good time. That's why he's calling us to have a good time as well. There's nothing wrong with laughter, enjoying life, smiling, jokes. God wants us to be happy. There's no room for sourpuss Christians. Who's going to want to join the church if we have sour faces, uninviting faces? And so Jesus is having a good time. He doesn't want to be bothered. That's why he says, what do you want of me, woman? Leave me alone. I don't want to do this. He's bothered by her. 
it's like the answer of somebody who refuses to get involved in the affairs of somebody else. But Jesus does get involved because his mother asks him to get involved. She knew that he was going to get involved because she turned to the waiters, not to him, and said, do whatever he tells you, because he was going to listen to her. And that's why we run to Mary. From the beginning of the church, Christians ran to Mary, just like here, these folks at the wedding feast at Cana ran to Mary, so we are called to do the same with our own problems and burdens. And she understands and takes those prayers to her son. We do not pray to Mary. You know that, right? We don't say, Holy Mary, Mother of God, hear our prayers. We don't say that, do we? We say, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. Just like I can ask any of you to pray for me, so I can ask Mary to pray for me. That's all we do with the saints. We don't worship saints. We don't adore saints. Worship and adoration is for God alone. We venerate saints. We respect them. We have images of them, statues, crosses, as holy reminders. You know, and the other interesting thing is, uh, one time I was sitting in, at home and it was about eight o'clock on sunday morning and i was getting ready for church and all of a sudden the doorbell rang and i went to the door and guess who it was it was the jehovah witnesses <laughs> could we talk to you <laughs> sure so try to be kind i mean it's it, I, you know, nothing, nothing I say to them will, will convince them and nothing they say to me will convince me, right? So we are to call to meet each other where we are at. Here's a cup of coffee. Let's sit and talk about the weather. You know, we don't... But they noticed all of these images that I had and all my statues and they started saying, don't you know that you're not supposed to have images and statues? The Bible prohibits them. No, the Bible prohibits idols. Idols not images or statues. I said, oh really, let me see your wallet. And one of them took out their wallet and they, and they happened to have a hundred dollar bill. And I said, well, the Bible, oh, let me see that. And I said, well, what is this on here? What's this? Isn't that an image of, who's this president here? Or Franklin, no, he wasn't a president. Ben Franklin, right? Okay, I said, well, give me your Franklin here. And I went quickly and I got one of those uh, lighters. And I said, here, and they, I lit it. And I said, well, see, the Bible says, let's get rid of all images. So, uh, come on, you know. <laughs> Let's get rid of all images. Let's be real, okay? Let's be real. Let's be normal. You have pictures of your loved ones. They have pictures of their loved ones. Having pictures of saints or having pictures of Mary or statues of Mary or crosses. It's like having pictures of your loved ones. We don't pray to the statue. We don't pray to an image. It helps us. It's a reminder. If your loved one dies, you have something of them. Some of us even carry things of our loved ones right, on, on us because it helps us. We're, we feel connected to them. I have a cross by my bed every day. I take a cross and I give it a kiss in the morning. I'm not kissing the cross there. I'm giving Jesus a kiss. How, how else would I do it? You know? <laughs> It's all we do as Catholics. So deep down, this gospel illustrates Jesus' genuine concern about the people at this wedding feast. In Mediterranean culture, if you threw a party, you better have had enough wine. Otherwise, don't have a party. You don't run out of wine. It's shameful, deep shame. And this is exactly what Jesus felt that this family was pained with. And he feels their pain. And he's moved with pity for them. That's why he intercedes. And this story shows us how Jesus is like so many of us in so many human ways. We don't want to be bothered. 
with the problems of others, don't we? And yet, if we are followers of Jesus, he's calling us to feel bothered, to respond. I want to end pointing out something else here. How many jars of water were there over there? There were six jars. Six. The Bible presents the number six as something incomplete, something lacking, something not quite there. That's why the number for the devil is 666, because he's incomplete. He's lacking. He's not quite there. There's something wrong. That's why the number six is an incomplete number in the Bible. And Mary says to the waiters, do as he tells you. And when you do what Jesus says, you will be complete. In other words, there's just six, there's six jars there. But when you do what Jesus says in your life, you will be complete. When people do what Jesus says, water becomes a surprising abundance of the best wine of all. In other words, our bridegroom has arrived in our life. With new wine, the wedding party of the new covenant has begun. Jesus is with us. And when we do as he calls us to, when we live as he's calling us to live, will be complete. We won't lack in anything, for He is with us as we pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for your many gifts in our life, that you have come to complete us, to fill us with a new way of living, a new way of looking at the world, a new way of looking at one another. And we glorify you for your presence as we pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, never shall be, world without end. Amen. And may the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Remember, just a couple announcements.